Our speaker for today's webinar, ICON 61 San Juan Recap, is Mark Monitor, Vice President, Vice President Global Policy and Industry Development, Stat Staten Hammock. For more than 15 years, Staten has provided companies with strategic business advice and guidance on internet policy, domain name strategy, compliance, and brand protection. As former general counsel and officer of several public, private, and nonprofit corporations in the internet industry, including Network Solutions, Enom, RightSide, Namejet, and Name.com, Staten has led teams that have developed tactics, policies, procedures, and industry best practices to tackle several forms of abusive online behavior, including consumer fraud, decimation of counterfeit goods, illegal pharmacies, and trademark infringement. Staten holds a BA in government from the University of Virginia and a JD from the University of Maine School of Law. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Staten to get us started. Thank you very much, Roland. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. It's uh, a pleasure to be with you to deliver this recap on ICANN 61, uh, the last meeting, uh, the policy forum meeting. Uh, there's lots to cover, <laughs> uh, and so I want to leave time for questions. So uh, I'd like us to just jump right in and uh, begin. So this is the path I think we'll uh, journey together to the, uh, today. We're going to uh, start just again with a reminder on, on Mark Bonner's presence at ICANN meetings, why we go, why we pick up uh, some important information and why we have this webinar. Then we'll jump into just an overview of the San Juan meeting, uh, the ICANN meeting format and some of the um, main topics and most well-attended sessions that uh, we observe there. Um, then we'll go into uh, GDPR, uh, which was uh, the dominant uh, discussion topic for uh, the San Juan meeting. But there were some other uh, topics of interest, which uh, I'd like to share with you and give you some updates on. And then, uh, as we normally do, uh, reiterate uh, and, and give you some ideas of how you can get involved both in uh, the ICANN policymaking uh, process, but also in other advocacy efforts as it relates to brand protection and domain name management. And then we'll do Q&A. So I hope you'll be uh, throwing me some good uh, questions, both softballs and, and, and tough ones. So uh, again, just for uh, a reminder, you know, Mark Monitor has, has been active at ICANN since its early formation of, of a business. Uh, we go to ICANN meetings regularly to advocate on behalf of our clients' intellectual property rights, uh, as well as uh, to encourage policies that enhance consumer trust and safety. We also are active participants in the policy development process uh, on working groups, uh, committees and steering groups, uh, constituency stakeholder groups, all of which uh, contribute to ICANN's policy development. And finally, we, we attend because there are many senior officials, strategic partners, some of our clients, governments, law enforcement partners that we interact with both on the domain side of our business and on the brand protection side of our business that attend ICANN. And we want to develop, cultivate, and deepen those relationships. And we're, in, we're able to do that at these ICANN meetings as it brings together many people uh, from across the internet ecosystem. So that's why we go, and uh, uh, from, from our experience at ICANN, we usually generate this uh, webinar to update you on the information that we both uh, got from the, the meeting and also uh, we were able to push out during the meeting. So let's go to the quick facts about San Juan uh, and the meeting that was held there just last week. So it was the community, community forum format. ICANN has three different meeting formats. Uh, one of those meetings, each of those meetings occurs uh, every year. This was the community forum uh, uh, meeting format. It's a six day meeting format. It has a full schedule of uh, information sessions, policy meetings, uh, constituency and stakeholder group meetings. Uh, there's some community outreach at this meeting, though not quite as much as the full annual general meeting. Uh, which was the last meeting we attended, uh, but there's still quite a bit of work by uh, intercommunity working groups. There's a forum 
uh, a public forum where uh, attendees can address the ICANN board of directors. So it was a pretty robust schedule and we had uh, four people from Mark Monitor in attendance, myself, Deb Giddings, uh, Sherry Hildebrand and Prudence Malinke. Uh, we were one of 1,400 in attendance. The sessions with the highest attendance, participation and interest were, uh, not surprisingly, who is and GDPR. Um, but there was also quite a bit of, quite a number of sessions on the work of the subsequent procedures uh, working groups. That's the group that is examining the uh, new GTLD program and uh, coming up with any policy changes or recommendations for future um, procedures uh, with respect to launch of new GTLDs. There was also ongoing work of the rights protection mechanisms evaluation and review. And uh, the GAC, of course, the Government Advisory Committee uh, was active in looking at GDPR geographic names at the top level and at the secondary level. So those are the sessions that we felt were the most well attended um, uh, at this ICANN. And not since the run up to the launch of new GTLDs has there been so much focus on a single topic, which is GDPR. And um, so uh, whether, whether you can stomach any more GDPR discussion or not, uh, unfortunately, I think it needs to be the focus of uh, uh, this webinar because uh, of its great impact uh, to not just the domain name industry, but to uh, the brand protection and IP rights industry as well. So uh, only one slide on, on what GDPR actually is. It's a, um, it's a very complex uh, privacy piece of red legislation intended to harmonize the data protection and privacy laws across Europe. The enforcement of it begins on May 25th of 2018. The regulation, in fact, has been around for more than a year, but um, uh, the enforcement by the data protection authorities begins on May 25th. It applies to data subjects residing in the EU and uh, applies only to uh, the identifiable data of a natural person. Uh, that means not a corporate entity or legal entity like a company, uh, but only to a natural person. Um, it governs the collection, retention, and processing of data, and it requires that any such collection, retention, and processing of the data uh, be adequate, relevant, and limited in its purpose. The impact uh, that we most feel, though, is uh, how it's going to apply to the public display of the WHOIS data. Um, and WHOIS data, of course, is the uh, data that is collected by a registrar when you register a domain name. Um, it includes registrant name, email address, physical address, phone number, fax, administrative and billing and technical contact information, and other data which is used to identify uh, the domain name holder. Um, during the last ICANN meeting in November that, that took place in Abu Dhabi, ICANN asked the community to submit promote, proposed models for who is that would be GDPR compliant. And uh, when that solicitation went out, of course, they got quite a bit of return. Um, on that. And so here's a snapshot of um, the number of different proposed models that the community uh, proposed to ICANN for uh, the public and non-public, for both the public and non-public display of who is data. Uh, there was uh, eight in all, three ICANN models proposed and five models proposed by various other organizations in the, um, in the community. And after weeks of uh, digesting all those comments, ICANN published its model uh, just shortly before the ICANN meeting in San Juan. They called it uh, the calzone model, um, I think because it includes many different ingredients from some of these models that were uh, solicited by ICANN from the community. Um, and according to ICANN, they have sent this model, the Calzone model, to the data protection authorities for them to consider and provide some advice and comment on. 
And I'd like to just run through the elements of that model if you haven't had a chance yet. And once you do, when I, when I do do this, you should be able to sort of get a better understanding of what who is, uh, is likely to look at, look like going forward. So here's just a few key elements. Uh, first of all, uh, registrars uh, will still collect all of the same information from a registrant as it currently does. In other words, everything, all the thick, they call that the thick who is data, that includes the registrant name, the email address, the physical location, the um, uh, contact information, all the admin and billing contact, all of that information will still be collected by the registrar. So there's no change um, with respect to a registrant's uh, experience uh, in terms of you know, providing this information. That thick who is data will also be transferred to the registry operator, that is the manager of the top level, um, and it will also be transferred to an escrow uh, agent. And you know, these, again, are currently the requirements under existing ICANN contracts with registries and registrars, so nothing changes there. The data retention uh, of that information will be the life of the registration of the domain name plus uh, two years is what's being proposed. Um, so that's sort of, uh, all of that is kind of status quo in, in, in a sense. Now, uh, the applicability of uh, the GDPR compliant who is model is, um, is actually uh, extends a little beyond the actual scope of the regulation because, as I mentioned, it applies to, uh, GDPR is meant to apply to uh, natural persons in the EU whose data is collected and processed in the EU. But under the ICANN model, uh, they, uh, registrars uh, can extend uh, the GDPR rules to uh, non-EU uh, citizens and apply it globally. So that's a concession that, that ICANN has made to, to registrars who were arguing that identification of, um, of whether uh, a registrant is an EU citizen and is, falls under the scope of, uh, of GDPR would be uh, a little bit too complicated for them to parse out. And so ICANN is allowing them to apply the regulation uh, globally to all registrants. Also, ICANN is allowing registrars to apply um, the GDPR compliant model to uh, legal persons as well as natural persons, which again, goes beyond the actual scope of, of the regulation, uh, but is um, a bit of concession to registrars who have to go through the process of, of vetting, who would otherwise have to go through the process of, of vetting uh, the registrant uh, for this information. So um, what, what information will actually be available uh, now after uh, application of, or implementation of this ICANN Who Is model? Well, you're going to see the registrant organization if, it, there's, if it's applicable. In other words, if it's a legal entity or corporate entity, you'll see the registrant organization name, but you will not see the registrant name if that is a natural person. Um, in terms of address, rather than seeing the street uh, address, as you now can, uh, you will only see the registrant state or province and country. Um, and so you will still be able to identify where the registrant is located for jurisdictional purposes, but you will not be able to precisely, you won't be able to know uh, precisely where that registrant is located because you will not have a street address, you will not have a postal address or in a uh, postal code or any of that information. You will also not be able to see the registrant email address right now uh, or in this model. However, um, ICANN is uh, requiring that, there, that registrars create some sort of anonymized email or web form so that there is some mechanism by which you can contact the registrant should you need to for any variety of reasons, uh, not just for um, uh, infringement reasons, but you could contact the registrant just to find out more ad additional information regarding uh, its online presence. There is no uh, registrant phone and fax. 
there uh, is another anonymized email address for the admin and technical contacts, but again, no public information regarding their physical address, their phone number, fax number, or anything of that nature. Um, and then the last uh, key element, well, not the last key element, but one of the other elements that was added uh, late to the model was an opt-in provision so that registrants who wish to actually have all of their uh, WHOIS data publicized in WHOIS can opt in for any additional data to be published. There are a number of um, companies and businesses that want to be transparent and want their customers and consumers to know and understand that they are uh, the entity behind uh, an e-commerce site or any website. And so it's important for them that their who has information actually be uh, public. And so there is an opt-in option now for registrants who want to uh, have all of their uh, data publicized. Oops, sorry. Um, now, there is uh, a, one of the big elements uh, uh, in this model is the access model to the non-public who is. And that uh, is a subject that we'll uh, talk about at length uh, in just a few minutes. But um, the ICANN proposed model uh, does not create any sort of, uh, it doesn't prescribe a process by which uh, you can see all of the thick who is data that I mentioned is collected. Um, uh, again, as I explained, right now, when you go to a who is database, you see all of the who is information. That information will continue to be collected post GDPR enforcement. However, you won't be able to see it uh, through a regular who is uh, query. So the question arises, how does uh, one see that full who is data? And the ICANN model does prescribe that there be an accreditation program to accredit uh, interested third parties, parties that are interested in uh, seeing the who is data an opportunity to do that or mechanism to do that, but the ICANN model doesn't uh, set out a, a specific process. It just says there should be a process for accreditation and access to this information. Um, but no, no uh, process is actually uh, specified in their current model. So that's a, a quick summary of the interim model. So what should uh, uh, we are uh, as a brand protection company or as a company itself who has an, uh, intellectual property rights that it needs to uh, enforce expect uh, should we assume that this model becomes part of the ICANN contract? Well, when you look at uh, you know, the way that companies and Mark Monitor enforce brand protection and do domain name management, we rely uh, uh, not heavily, but the, uh, who is data is certainly a component of, of all the brand enforcement work that we do and that other companies do. So with limited data, um, there's going to be uh, uh, there's going to be more manual effort that's going to be needed in order to confirm uh, the identity of uh, users of domain names and websites. Uh, we'll also we'll also have to go through whatever validation and accreditation process uh, finally gets baked into the model. As I said, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But companies uh, who have IP departments or outside counsel that regularly do their enforcement work uh, will have to you know become accredited, and we don't know what that process looks like yet. Um, any reverse who is lookup service, so that is any triangulation that that uh, you might use, any tool you might use to triangulate data to identify who's behind multiple websites or domain names that could be infringing or, um, you know, trying to find out the identity of, of, of any one of those registrants is going to be difficult with the limited who is DAC access. And also the question of, of bulk access uh, is still, still remains up in the air and not addressed by the ICANN model. So there's a lot uh, more 
uh, work that has to be done uh, to uh, refine the model and, and, and make it more workable. So our advocacy efforts right now uh, are still uh, full on. Uh, we're gonna continue to advocate for the adoption of a model that maintains the current who is system to the greatest extent possible while being compliant with GDPR. And if you've heard, and if you've heard uh, this uh, directive before, it's, it's been actually expressed by ICANN organization itself. Uh, this is their mandate, uh, and we want to uh, make sure that they uh, meet that uh, directive. So uh, we will be continuing our advocacy efforts with companies, organizations, businesses, cybersecurity companies, brand protection companies to uh, advocate for uh, the who is system that we can, um, uh, that is GDPR compliant, but also affords us uh, a window into the information and data that we uh, regularly rely upon for enforcement work. So here's, um, I'd like to turn now to the accreditation and access model that I mentioned earlier. During the meeting, uh, a group of companies, public safety organizations, legal experts, cybersecurity firms, uh, and, and Mark Monitor as well, along with many of its uh, competitors in the space, um, worked on uh, an accreditation and access model and purpose statement for this model uh, that we could propose to ICANN to, uh, for, for third parties who were interested in gaining access to the full who is um, data. And this model was based on examples from the work of the expert working group on the registry directed director of services, the next generation who is that was done in 2014. And uh, we built upon some of those uh, concepts for the purpose statement and for structuring the uh, accreditation process. Uh, the process proposed no new changes to the architecture of the current WHOIS system. Um, with minimal coding changes, uh, we could accredit users. Uh, we believe there's a process whereby uh, a third party could validate and accredit users who could then take some sort of uh, token or other um, uh, signal of acceptance or validation to the registrar, uh, which the registrar would trust then. Uh, and allow access to the full who is data. So uh, the, the model includes uh, a detailed list of the kinds of uh, entities or third parties who may uh, be seeking access, the limited, uh, the legitimate and lawful purposes for accessing that data, because um, not only do you have to identify uh, two data protection authorities who uh, should be getting uh, gaining access, but what is their legitimate and lawful purpose for that? Um, then there needs to then we've proposed some um, accreditation schema for that, uh, a detailed purpose statement for the collection, storage, and processing. Um, in addition to having a statement of a legitimate uh, purpose, we have to have a really granular, specific. Um, use case for each of the collect for each organization or each entity that seeks um, access to the data uh, with respect to the collection, storage, and processing. And we've also provided in this model some terms of the accreditation. What uh, doesn't uh, the model is not complete yet? I should say uh, there is uh, quite a bit more that uh, we wanna add to the model at this point. But time was, of course, of the essence at San Juan and uh, those who were, who were working diligently and feverishly to pro uh, propose a model to ICANN, obviously we couldn't vet all aspects of it. So it's out there for public comment now on the ICANN website, but it doesn't have some of the technical implementation details. For example, who is going to be the third party validation uh, person or entity for the accreditation and how will it uh, 
how will you get that token and how, and how will your users, if you're an organization who has multiple uh, employees that want to, that need to be validated, how will that work? So those, those specific details haven't um, uh, yet been uh, articulated in the model. Uh, there's also uh, a need for further development of accreditation specifics and there needs to be some functional specifications actually written for how this will be implemented, not just by the um, accreditation authority, but by the registrars and, and potentially the registries as well. Um, there's also uh, some work to be done by the commercial stakeholder group to refine uh, the certification criteria for intellectual property groups. And ICANN has asked the GAC to define the certification criteria for law, for law enforcement agencies around the world. So there'll be, there'll be separate criteria to validate law enforcement as opposed to other third party interests like cybersecurity uh, analysts and experts like brand protection ex experts like corporations and, and intellectual property of uh, law firms and, and representatives of uh, IP interests. So there's a lot of heavy lifting yet to do, but it was important to get that accreditation and access model out there as soon as possible so the community could chew on it and uh, provide some input to it. Now, in the meantime, while all this is going on, uh, just a, a slide here on what Mark Monitor is doing internally to prepare. Uh, I mentioned in a recent webinar to our clients that we are going through our WHOIS database right now to make sure there's no uh, information from about a natural person existing in our own WHOIS. So we're doing a scrub on that. We are also doing an impact assessment of all of our enforcement efforts across all of our lines of business, whether it be counterfeit, uh, piracy, fraud, uh, and or domains, and to find out you know, what level of dependence on who is data and which fields do we currently rely on, and is there some other data uh, source or other ways we can achieve the same level of enforcement uh, by using another method other than looking at who is. And we're working on mitigation strategies across all of our uh, products and service lines so that we can continue to provide uh, the same services that, that uh, our clients have grown accustomed to, to getting. Uh, we're also con consulting with legal and privacy consultants on next steps and getting their opinion on the ICANN model and uh, whatever model that we want uh, to uh, implement at Mark Monitor. And of course, we're stepping up our advocacy efforts, both in ICANN and with DPAs and with um, other groups that, uh, that weigh in on, on this issue. So in summary, what we're going to aim to do in the next uh, several weeks, uh, and likely months ahead is leverage our technology and our partnerships and our client services team to maintain the highest standards of domain name protection um, and brand protection services in our industry. And we will uh, endeavor to keep you updated on those efforts as we, as we go uh, forward. But not everything is GDPR. So uh, I'd like to spend a uh, the last uh, few minutes of the presentation talking about the other work that went on at, at ICANN. Uh, in previous webinars, we've spent uh, more time updating you on the work of the working groups that we're involved in. Uh, but GDPR certainly sucked the, uh, the air out of the room in almost every session. And so uh, I'm making this, uh, these updates here a little more brief than, uh, than normal. So um, I apologize for that. And if there's uh, specific questions about any of this work uh, that you're curious, please send me a question at the end of the webinar or uh, send it to me after the webinar and I'd be happy to provide some more details. But um, going quickly through the remainder of, of the work, um, Sherry and Prudence 
uh, have the relationships with uh, our registry partners, and they're, uh, they spent uh, much of their time also talking to them about pricing, about enforcement issues, around getting registry lock implemented uh, at every registry so that uh, our clients and partners have some security when it comes to their domain name registrations. They're also paying attention to uh, any changes in registry operations. Uh, for example, um, uh, Donuts is, is one of the largest new GTLD registries. They acquired RightSide uh, six months ago. They're migrating the RightSide platform into the Donuts platform. That will create some uh, additional work for us and some work for our clients. Uh, uh, not a whole lot of work for the clients, but uh, just some information and communication. Uh, there's also um, the launch of .app uh, by Google in a few weeks, and so we're working to prepare for that. And so that's the kind of work that uh, Sherry and Prudence do often at ICANN meetings to stay on top of you know, changes that the registries are making with respect to uh, its offerings. Additionally, our team participated uh, in our stakeholder group meetings. We're members of the business constituency. Um, and the intellectual property constituency, which are both part of the commercial stakeholder group. Because we are also a registrar, we are a member of the registrar stakeholder group. So we cover quite a bit of, of, uh, of meetings when we're there. Uh, there's very few companies that have an interest in as many uh, working groups and constituency groups as we do. Uh, and, we're, and we do our best to, to cover off on all of that work. Uh, we are members of um, the, subs the new GTLD Subsequent Procedures Working Group, the RDS Next Generation Who Is, and the Review of Rights Protection Mechanisms. Uh, let me just say uh, as a general point that um, all of these groups' work is progressing, uh, although slower than I think uh, the ICANN community and members of these groups would like. Uh, the Subsequent Procedures Group, I'm on the work track five group which deals with uh, geographic names we're working to have a report done uh, this summer our first report done this summer um, and to hopefully wrap up uh, the, all of the all of the different work traps work uh, streams hope to wrap up in uh, second quarter of 2019 uh, the R the review of the rpms group uh, as i mentioned in the last report they've uh, been through a review of um, the post-delegation uh, dispute resolution process, the URS process. They have on their window the um, UDRP process to review. That work is ongoing. There's been some change in, in chairs over the last uh, couple of months, so uh, I expect there to be some new leadership uh, and new, new blood in that in that working group, which I think will be very helpful to it um, working. Um, and then finally, the RDS, Next Generation of Who Is. That is actually the long-term solution for the Who Is issue and what is uh, uh, ultimately going to be the final uh, Who Is model. That's why I refer to the ICANN model as the interim model. Uh, because it is interim in the sense that it is the who is model that will be uh, made available uh, that we're going to work under until the RDS next generation who is uh, working group uh, comes up with their recommendations. Here's an interesting topic, one that doesn't often hit the, uh, the radar at ICANN, but that's the budget. So for the first time in more than seven years, ICANN funding uh, has stabilized and is not in growth mode. And so therefore, ICANN announced the need to sort of cut back on some of its expenditures related for certain projects and programs. And um, there's been, there was quite a bit of discussion in a few sessions at ICANN about which uh, projects and programs would be impacted. Um, Looking at their fiscal year 19 budget, uh, there are impacts to the fellowship programs, which bring aboard um, interested uh, young people and academics 
to the ICANN policymaking process. Uh, travel for certain ICANN employees may in fact be impacted going forward. Um, funding for certain ICANN participants may be curtailed. ICANN uh, prides itself on you know, the multi-stakeholder model, which invites people from all over the globe to attend. Many of those participants can't afford to make the trip and attend ICANN, so ICANN uh, rightly uh, and has in the past generously supported many people's attendance, but that might have to be uh, curtailed just a bit. And the last point I thought, uh, which is interesting to add, is that uh, the budget doesn't contain any preparatory work for the next round of new GTLDs. So uh, if any of you were paying attention to the first round of new GTLDs, you know it took you know, several years of preparatory work to get to the point where uh, the application window was made available uh, for, those, for folks to apply. And uh, there's no work currently uh, being done in that effort uh, towards that, and there's no budget uh, for any of that preparatory work. So I thought that was interesting uh, to highlight. So we're nearing the end here, and uh, I always like to include this slide for those of you who uh, are still alert and interested in the work that's happening. There is a place for you to become involved. Uh, the ICANN business constituency and the intellectual property constituency, which are two stakeholder groups that we are actively involved in. The business constituency, constituency is made up of uh, businesses who have an interest in ICANN's uh, policy making. Uh, as it relates to the who is, of course, we've been very vocal about the necessity of being able to see uh, who might be infringing our trademarks, who might be infringing on our products and services. Uh, if you're a business, then that group uh, is some is a group that you need to, uh, that you might want to join. The intellectual property constituency, mostly made up of intellectual property lawyers, attorneys, firms, uh, some brand protection companies. Uh, they have uh, their own stakeholder group at ICANN. The brand registry group is a group of um, uh, individuals who represent uh, top-level domain names that have a dot brand in it, like dot Nike. Uh, and if you are one of those, that is an active group. They are looking uh, to make changes and to give input, especially for the next round of GTLDs, as many uh, brand owners are interested in applying for their dot brand in the next, uh, the next round. And finally, uh, the Domain Name Association uh, is the uh, trade association for the domain name industry. I'm a founding board member, so I have a little bit of a, a bias towards this organization, but uh, you can join for a, a reasonably inexpensive uh, membership fee and uh, have access to a lot of information uh, regarding the industry. The next meeting uh, will be the policy forum meeting in, Porter, in um, Panama City. The policy forum is the smallest meeting format. It has, uh, it runs only four days. Uh, there will not be uh, many of the general sessions there. There will not be a public forum session. Uh, it's, it's the least uh, well attended, but that does not mean there isn't a, a good amount of work that will uh, take place there. Uh, even though GDPR enforcement will have already begun uh, at that time, uh, I can guarantee you there will be quite a bit of uh, further discussion about um, the ICANN model, about the accreditation and access model, uh, what the, G, uh, the data protection authorities will be doing in terms of enforcement. And so uh, following that, we will of course give you another update uh, to uh, keep you apprised of any events that come out of uh, that new, that the next meeting in Panama City. So with that, uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, Roland, can you help me with the queue, please? 
Sure. Excellent. Thank you, Staten. Uh, so we did have a couple of questions come through. And again, if you do have a question, uh, you you can uh, ask the question at the Q&A tab at, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but the first question we have is, is it possible to delay GDPR enforcement until a complete solution is implemented? Uh, great question. Well, um, many people would like to see a delay of, uh, in enforcement. Um, I think legally, uh, there's no there's no way to extend the enforcement deadline. The data protection authorities are uh, required to begin enforcement on May 25th. Now, having said that, we have communicated and uh, and there have been communications publicly by some DPAs who have given not formally uh, but informally assurance that. Uh, if an organization uh, like ICANN and the registrar registries are working towards a solution but have not been able to fully bake a solution, then uh, they will not uh, be seeking to enforce. Um, that sort of assurance not coming in writing is a little comfort to registries and registrars. However, I think realistically, uh, I don't think uh, GDPR uh, the, the enforcement of, of the first targets for enforcement uh, by the DPAs is going to be the domain name industry and registrars. There are certainly larger companies with bigger uh, data privacy and data protection interests than the domain name industry. So I think putting everything in context, there won't, uh, there's not going to be enforcement day one, but um, we are looking to uh, get some sort of, um, formal forbearance notice, if that's, if that's even possible, by the DPAs so that we can continue our work within the ICANN community and, and put a model in place without uh, having to flip the switch on who is and make it go, make it go dull, dark. Okay, and then uh, the next question we have is, what happens if DPAs don't approve the ICANN model? Right, so uh, yes, as I mentioned, the uh, ICANN has proposed the model to the DPAs for advice and comment. Uh, there is some speculation as to, as to whether they'll actually do that or not, or there's some, I should say, there's some uh, open debate uh, within ICANN circles whether DPAs would, would, would give any advice at all. So if we assume that there is no advice, uh, then ICANN likely will not insist that its model be adopted, which means we're going to be facing a patchwork of GDPR compliant who is models based on the legal advice that registries and registrars um, are, um, uh, have, have sought from their own legal counsel. So uh, that's not an ideal solution, obviously, because from an enforcement perspective, now you have to learn, um, you know, multiple GDPR compliant models and, and engage uh, differently with each of the registrars if you're seeking who is data. So uh, we are pushing hard for uh, one unified model, uh, imperfect as it may ultimately be, but, you know, that's better than an alternative model of, of several. Okay, and then the, the question we have now, Staten, is where can companies send comments about open who is? Thank you for that question. Yeah, that's a good one. So um, there's two, there's actually two or three places where it would be terrific if you're a company or a brand owner to provide comments. One is to ICANN directly. Uh, if you look on uh, ICANN's uh, web page, you can go to GDPR um, and there's an email box. I believe it's GDPR at ICANN.org. Uh, that is an email box where you can send public comments to ICANN regarding uh, anything related to the models that have been posted, the interim model, the accreditation and access model, uh, all of the comments that have previously been posted over the course of the last Several months appear there, so it's a good repository for information. Um, 
So that's one, uh, one place where your voice can be heard. A second is with uh, your data protection authority. So if you have a business or company based in, uh, in Europe somewhere, you have a DPA. And I would uh, strongly advise you sending a note to your DPA uh, if you're concerned about IP protection, uh, uh, send a note to your DPA expressing that concern and encouraging them to uh, afford ICANN some additional time to put in an accreditation and access model so that you and others will be able to, to see the WHOIS data for enforcement purposes. So that's another um, uh, place where you could advocate. A third is with the Article 29 Working Party. That's, a, that's the working party uh, uh, formed for uh, implementation of GDPR. Um, and they're taking comments and feedback now on, uh, on the application of GDPR to certain industries. They have, uh, ICANN has corresponded with members of, of them um, previously. The Article 29 Working Party, they have uh, sent some uh, helpful advice and comments back to the group. Um, but uh, uh, that's, they're, they're listening. And uh, uh, as part of uh, a little coalition of groups, we've been sending uh, our correspondence and feedback to the Article 29 Working Party as well. So that's three. Um, okay, so I see a couple other questions here. Um, Ah, I, so the question is, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading it. ICANN is no longer accepting Google Maps as a way to prove that the who is listed address is fake and doesn't exist. Do you know of any other ways to show the address is fake? Um, that's a good question. No, I'm, I don't know of any. Um, one of the things I'm learning um, is in conversations with my team internally about uh, finding new sources of data. I mentioned that earlier about mitigation steps. There is a lot of data out there that uh, a person can, can discover about a website. You can read metadata, which is uh, in, the, in the link in the, in, at a web, or on a website that uh, does uh, indicate source of, sources of information that had been previously available at Whois. So all of those uh, sources we're looking at and others should look at uh, to, to find out uh, information about a given registrant going forward. Uh, I'm not aware of any other way to validate a physical location, um, uh, but maybe uh, somebody's working on a solution that would, would be uh, helpful for all of us in the future. Uh, I see another question here. Thanks. Um, is Mark Bonner collecting who is data at the present time for resale at a later time in the event that public who is goes dark? Uh, no, we don't have any plans to, uh, to resell who is data. Not only that, uh, once the data does go dark, the who is data is, is, is only good from that point of time that you're able to uh, go back and, and uh, confirm it. Um, and if there's no uh, updates to who is in the, if we're not able to see all of the who is data, uh, the, the data that we do have would be stale after a certain point. Um, but we don't uh, make that data available for resale uh, anyway. Um, what is your view of the various blocking methods like DPML, T-Rex, and, other, uh, and others? Okay, um, that's a good question. That's uh, not one I, I covered off on during this presentation, but happy to uh, talk about that. So uh, some of the registries uh, post GTLD launch came up with their own uh, rights protection mechanism, a voluntary rights protect protection mechanism that will uh, enable uh, re uh, registrants to protect their trademarks across multiple TLDs. Um, these registries were right side, donuts, minds and machines, uh, there may have been others, but those three portfolio applicants basically came out with a blocking service. And if you register uh, 
If you subscribe to their blocking service, you can register their trade, your trademark with them, which will block across all of the TLDs that are part of their portfolio. It is a reasonably cost-effective way of blocking uh, names from uh, registration by nefarious uh, trademark infringers uh, at one at one time at a low at one low cost rather than having to register them defensively. Um, I think the view from the from the trade from the brand owner community has been pretty tepid, uh, but. Um, uh, Deloitte is jumping right in, and that's one of the things you, uh, the, the, the question provider uh, mentioned was T-Rex. T-Rex is Deloitte, uh, and Touche, who is the uh, operator of the TMCH, is uh, own blocking service. So if you have a trademark in the TMCH, Deloitte will uh, block the, will help provide tokens that will block across any registry that is uh, a partner with the TMCH. Uh, I am told 40 TLDs have now signed up for um, for the T-Rex, Deloitte's T-Rex program. Frankly, I haven't looked at the cost or the details of that program myself, so I'm a little uh, a little sketchy on, on details. One of my team members I know has looked at that in his conversations with Deloitte, but I, I can't uh, provide too many specifics at this point. Um, but uh, that is yet another another opportunity to, um, to do a cost-effective uh, cost effective trademark protection across multiple TLDs. Uh, one other question here is, uh, how do individuals become involved in the commercial stakeholder group relating to the who is accreditation process? Well, it's pretty easy. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member of, an, of the commercial stakeholder group, uh, you just need to go to their page and ask to become a member uh, the fee, I don't know what the fee is, but it's, it's reasonable. It's in the hundreds of dollars to be put on the mailing list, and then you can contribute. The great thing about ICANN is that it is a bottoms-up, multi-stakeholder consensus policy development process, driven process, and anybody can participate. Uh, you don't have to have a certain number of, of clients, customers, revenue. Uh, you can have a passing interest or an avid interest in the work that ICANN does. So uh, it's open to, to everyone. And with that, I don't see any other questions, Roland. Great. Thank you again, Staten. We appreciate you sharing your presentation with our audience. I'd also like to thank everyone tuning in for their participation in this morning's webinar. As a reminder, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the webinar's presentation slides and a recording within the next couple of days. So you can be on the lookout for that email. That con concludes our webinar for today. Thank you again for tuning in, and everybody have a great day. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a nice day.